Welcome to part three of the Avalanche Level 2 wa weather module. In the following, we will discuss the key weather metrics used to assess avalanche risk and sources of weather information. Let's get started. The avalanche prone areas of North America can be divided into three regions, each with unique weather climates and snowpack characteristics. These regions are the maritime region, heavily influenced by the Pacific Ocean, the continental region, which is heavily influenced by Arctic air masses from Alaska, and the transitional region, which is a mix of maritime and continental. Let's look at the characteristics of each of these. The maritime region includes the coast and cascade ranges of Oregon, Washington, California, and British Columbia. This is us. This region is characterized by large amounts of snow resulting in deep snowpacks. The snow has a high moisture content, so it tends to stabilize quickly after a storm. Rain events can occur throughout the season, so wet avalanches are more common than in other regions. Forecasting is done primarily from weather observations. Let's look more specifically at the Pacific Northwest. As we mentioned, the predominant influence is the warm, moist air from the Pacific. The topography of the Northwest has a heavy influence on weather events. The Cascade Range blocks most of the cold air from Alaska, keeping the temperatures fairly mild throughout the winter. However, there are two gaps, the Fraser River Gap right here and the Columbia River Gorge along the Oregon-Washington border that allow much colder air from Alaska to reach the Western Cascades. The cold air mixes with the warmer, moist air off the Pacific Ocean and results in a very heavy snowfall. The continental region includes the mountain ranges of Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. The predominant weather influence in this region is very cold, dry Arctic air coming from the Alaska and the Western Plains of Canada. This region receives much less snow than the Maritime region, so the snowpack is shallower and the snow tends to be dry and susceptible to persistent weak layers and large slab avalanches. The primary forecasting tool in this region is snowpack structure analysis. The transitional region includes Eastern Oregon and Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and parts of Utah. This region is influenced by both the warm moist air from the Pacific and the cold air mass from Alaska. The characteristics of the snowpack are a mix of these found in the other two regions. Forecasting uses both meteorological analysis and snowpack structure analysis. The key question we're trying to answer is how does weather affect the snowpack? Or more specifically, is weather affecting the snowpack in a way that is increasing or reducing the avalanche risk? To do this, we must look at the weather history. What has the weather done in the last 24 hours? What has the weather done in the last week? What has the weather done in the last month? The snowpack is a record of weather history. So what parameters do we need to look at when assessing weather and its impact on avalanche risk? The weather triangle is a helpful model to keep in mind when thinking about weather. The weather triangle combines the three elements of weather, precipitation, wind, and temperature. For each element, the key parameters that affect avalanche risk are identified. For precipitation, the type, rain or snow, the rate, and the amount. For temperature, the trend, is the temperature increasing or decreasing, is it above or below freezing, and radiation effects. For wind, duration, speed, and direction. These parameters will help us answer the key question regarding weather. Let's look at each in more detail. Let's look at precipitation. The first question is what form is the precipitation? Rain or snow? Rain adds more weight without adding strength. It all also weakens the bond between grains and the snowpack. So rain is a bad thing for snowpack stability. When we talk about precipitation, we talk in terms of snow water equivalent or SWE. More on this in a moment. A second parameter of importance with precipitation is rate. How fast is the snow coming down? One foot of new snow in a day has a very different effect on the snowpack than one foot of new snow in a week. Rapid loading will add much more stress on the snowpack than the same loading spread over a longer time. 
Duration goes hand in hand with rate. How long has the snow been coming down? Density is important because dense snow, typical of Mount Hood for example, has a higher water content and adds more weight to the snowpack. Temperature has a large impact on density. Warm air temperature results in higher density snow. Low air temperature results in lower density snow. And of course, since temperature fluctuates, so will the density. Snow water equivalent, or SWE, is a measure of the water content of the snowpack. It is the equivalent amount of liquid water from a given volume of snow. For example, look at the figure on the top left. As the figure shows, for snow that has a density of 20%, that is water content of 20%, 10 units of snow would yield 2 units of liquid water, or equivalent. If the snow density were 10%, that is 10% water, the same amount of snow would yield 1 unit of liquid water when melted. The figure on the bottom gives some indication of water content in snow on the western Cascades versus water content of snow in the eastern Cascades. As you can see, the snow on the western Cascades has one and a half to two times the water content of snow on the eastern Cascades. There are several other key parameters related to precipitation that you should know, shown on this slide. I think they're all pretty self-explanatory, so I won't go through them in detail. Review them on your own and be prepared to use them in our breakout session. Pay particular attention to precipitation intensity PI and snowfall intensity SI. There are critical PI and SI rates that act as red flags for avalanche risk. For the maritime region, PI rates of one inch per hour or more and SI rates of one inch per hour or more should trigger concern for increased avalanche risk. This slide shows some examples of calculations for SWE and density. Please work through these on your own. We will do more examples in the breakout session. You should be able to calculate density and SWE from basic telemetry data. It's interesting to think about loading on a slope from precipitation. Look at the second point on the slide. One millimeter of, wa a millimeter of water on a 100 by 100 slope adds over 22,000 pounds of mass to the slope. In our previous example, the SWE was 0.8 inches of water equivalent. This is equivalent to 4.16 pounds per square foot. On a football field size slope, this would be an additional 240,000 pounds of mass. That's a lot of extra loading. The second leg of the weather triangle is wind. As we mentioned in part two, wind can load a slope 10 times faster than precipitation. On Mount Hood, wind loading and wind slabs are very common avalanche hazards. Key parameters to note are wind strength, wind direction, and wind duration. Also note that local terrain features will steer the wind so you can get very local effects that are not consistent with the larger macro wind patterns. For example, localized valleys or gullies can increase wind speed and magnify wind loading in very specific areas beyond what the avalanche forecasts are indicating. Temperature is the last leg of the weather triangle. It's important to differentiate between air temperature and snow temperature. Air temperature affects only the top portion of the snowpack through convection. The snow temperature is relatively stable deeper in the snowpack, and the ground is usually at a constant 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature history, particularly during storm cycles, is very important. Storms that start cold and then get warm result in upside down snowpack. In this case, the cold front deposits cold, low density snow. This snow is then covered by wet, high density snow as the warm front moves through. The wet, high-density snow will consolidate into a slab on top of the light, low-density, poorly consolidated snow. So, so there's now a consolidated layer over a weak layer, and the avalanche risk goes up. In the opposite situation, where the storm, storm starts warm and then gets colder, we end up with a low-density, poorly consolidated layer on top of a high-density, well-consolidated layer, and significantly reduced avalanche risk. So we have discussed the key weather parameters to monitor, but where do we get the weather information? 
This slide lists three useful websites, the National Weather Service, NWAC, and WINDY. There are many others. You should explore these sites and pick the ones you find most useful. For today's discussion, I will give a brief overview of the National Weather Service site. I will leave it to you to explore the other sites on your own. This is the home page for the National Weather Service site. You can place your cursor on the region of interest and double click to zoom in. For our, for our discussion today, I will zoom in in Oregon. When I double click on Oregon, the Portland National Weather Service office site opens, shown in the upper left. If you scroll down the page, you'll see a map of Oregon. Double click on the location of or in Oregon of interest. For today's discussion, I will select Mount Hood. When you double click on Mount Hood, the National Weather Service site on Mount Hood Meadows opens up, shown on the left on the slide. This will provide a seven day forecast for the Mount Hood Meadows area. If you scroll down, you'll see a variety of more detailed reports available. The report circled is an hourly report. If you double click on this, the hourly report shown in this slide appears. Know that you can select a backward view for two days or a forward forecast for the next two days. You can also select what parameters you're interested in with the checkoff box at the top. Another source of weather information is from the ski resorts themselves. The image on the left is from Mount Hood Meadows Telemetry Station. The image on the right is a manual weather record. You won't find many of these anymore except maybe very small resorts. This is a picture of a modern weather telemetry station. These are scattered around the western U.S. and Canada to track weather data and to develop weather history. The driving force behind the distribution of these weather stations is to track precip precipitation for water forecasting for agriculture. The avalanche community gets the benefit of this activity. This is an example of telemetry data and the resulting avalanche forecast data. The column on the left is measured data from telemetry stations for the most part, and the column on the right is the forecast data created by the avalanche forecaster. One final topic I'd like to touch on briefly is the Snowtail system. This is a system developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to track precipitation across the western U.S. The link to the Snowtail homepage is shown at the top. From this homepage, you can look at snowtail sites in any particular area. In this case, I have selected Oregon, so the colored dots are all the snowtail sites in Oregon. From here, you can select the sites that cover the area you're interested in and look at the raw telemetry data. The table on the right lets you filter for the particular data of interest. And this is the output of one of the snowtail sites. As you can see, historical data is provided for this site for the last month. Longer time periods are available if needed. The snowtail sites are one of the basic tools used in avalanche forecasters and snow science researchers to look at weather trends. I'd recommend you play around the NRCS site to see the full capabilities. And that brings us to the end of our weather module for avalanche level two. I would encourage all of you to start tracking the weather on Mount Hood. Make an estimate of what the current and past weather has done to the snowpack structure and check it out when you are on the mountain. How accurate was your estimate? By doing this routinely, you'll begin to develop a sense for how the weather forecasts you see translate into snowpack structure.